Good afternoon. I'm Jillian Lester, and I am really excited to see such a robust community presence today for this very special event. Uh, there are actually more of you as well uh, outside watching via a Facebook feed, so um, it's really uh, welcome. Welcome, everybody, both in and outside. It's a great pleasure for us here at Columbia Law School to host today's conversation with former FBI Director James Comey. It would be hard for me to imagine that there are any uh, of you in this room who don't know who our guest is here today. Uh, and so in some ways, uh, he needs no introduction, but let me just say a few words because uh, he really has had a truly distinguished career uh, in his path of leadership. It began, uh, his path of leadership in government service began with his appointment uh, as U.S. Attorney for the Southern District. He would later become Deputy Attorney General of the United States during the George W. Bush administration. After that, he did something that's uh, very familiar to many of us at Columbia. He, he moved from the public sector to the private sector. And for seven years, he, he served in two capacities, um, both general counsel, first uh, for Lockheed Martin, and, and then later for Bridgewater Associates. In early two th 2013, he made another change, and I, I'd like to, to think that this was a critically important change. Uh, he became senior research scholar and Hertog Fellow of National Security at ours truly, Columbia Law School. Uh, it, was, it was later that year, while he was uh, here at the law school, that Director Comey was tapped by President Obama to become director of the FBI. Uh, so in, in some ways, today's meeting is both a, a, a homecoming uh, and a reunion. I'd like to just uh, convey my thanks to Dan Richman, for, uh, uh, Professor Richman, and for his efforts to bring this event together and for moderating today's discussion. Uh, Director Comey and Professor Richman have been extremely generous uh, in the access and openness that they have granted to our community in participating in this conversation, and I know that we'll learn a great deal from it, and that uh, if we have time for Q&A, I know that you all in the audience will have, uh, will have thoughtful questions that I look forward to hearing. With that, please join me in welcoming Professor Dan Richman and Director James Comey to the stage. Does this work? Yes, it works. Yes. All right. So, this introduction uh, that the Dean generously gave did not include uh, many things, but, but I guess the big question is, do you regret not having stayed here as a research scholar? <laughs> Deeply. Deep. Um, it's great to be back with you all. I'm a little freaked that you're all here, and uh, I do miss being here. I loved being FBI director, but given the storm that's happened over the, since I left here, you hear me okay? Yeah, just uh, maybe it's just inside my head. Uh, the yeah, I do miss it. Yes, Dan. All right. So speaking of the storm, let, let's start with it. It doesn't take long on on social media or elsewhere to to get the sense that memories are still very raw in many parts of of the country and probably here uh, about what happened with respect to the Hillary Clinton investigation and you know, your announcement about its, the apparent closing of it, then your um, sending a letter to Congress about the reopening of it. And I guess there'll never be time, particularly given the constraints here, to go through the details of it. And I urge people to read um, your book or and or um, Jim Stewart's book, which really get into the details, as well as the um, Inspector General's report. But we'll get at a, at a higher level. I guess the question becomes regrets, um, thoughts about how you did things that should have been done differently. Yeah, no, it's an important question, and I get why people are still interested in it. It's a nightmare from which I can't awaken, unfortunately. I have deep regret that we were involved at all I remember the moment that I learned that we had begun a criminal investigation of Secretary Clinton. It was in the summer of 2015, and my deputy walked in and said, 
that the case had been opened, and then he said, deadpan, you know you're totally screwed, right? And what he meant was that in a hyper-polarized environment, there was no way we would finish that work without angering at least one half of the partisan spectrum. I had no idea we could piss everybody off, <laughs> but somehow we managed to do that. And, and again, I'm not gonna get into all the details. I do hope you all, if you have questions about it, we'll dive into it, because I think if you dive into the details, you will see it, even if you don't agree with decisions that I made, you'll see it very differently once you understand the doors that we faced. But given that we were in the middle of it, each time we came to a decision, there was never a good door, there were always two sucky doors. And the question was, which one sucks less? And which door is most consistent with this institution and its values? And we're imperfect people, and so I'm not I'm not arrogant about the decisions. I think people can see them differently. I'm very proud of the way we made the decisions in that case because we worked really hard not to make decisions based on political outcomes or an assessment of those kinds of things, but to try to figure out which is the least bad option here and then pursue that. I have regrets about small things uh, that I blew, about the way I said various things, but in the main, I hope it doesn't sound flip to you all, I've thought about it a million times, Given what I knew at the time, I actually think I'd do the same thing. And one of my very best people was a, the Deputy General Counsel, a woman named Tricia Anderson. And I'm sure you all know people like this. They're the kind of people who almost never speak. And, but when they do speak in class or in a meeting, you listen to them. And as we're making the decision in late October, 11 days before the election, she asked, Actually, she didn't ask. She started to raise her hand, then put it back down, and I saw her move, and so I called on her. And she, I said, Tricia, what? And she said, should you consider that what you're about to do may help elect Donald Trump President of the United States? And I said, thank you, thank you for asking that question. The answer is no, I can't, because down that path lies the death of the FBI as an independent institution. If I start trying to figure out how the decision will affect whose political fortunes in what way, we're just part of the tribal warfare. I have to ask which decision is most consistent with our values, with our norms, with our traditions, with who we are, and then make that decision. But thank you for asking it. And so people ask me all the time, did you help elect Donald Trump president? I don't know. I hope someday somebody proves that I had nothing to do with it. Uh, but, and I don't mean, that I, I worry that what I'm about to say may sound flip. Believe me, there's nothing flip about this for me. It actually doesn't matter to me because all it does is increase the pain. I, I think I made the right decision in the right way and I think it will stand the test of time. I hope to God it had no impact on the election but we made the decision recognizing that we could have an impact. It was a terrible decision. It was just better than the alternative which was simply awful. And that's how I feel about it and it's, it's a painful place for me, not because of me, I mean, I've taken all kinds of stuff, but because of the institution, the FBI, was hurt by decisions that I made. I believe it would have been hurt more had I chosen the alternatives, but I can't go back and relive and test that again. I'm proud of the people I was surrounded by. I'm proud of the way we made the decision. I wish to God we hadn't been involved. That's my synthesis. So without going to, to the entire um, sequence of decisions you made and just just focusing on on the October letter certainly there's been there was criticism not just by the inspector general but but by others that you talk about values and you talk about protecting the institution but but what you did what with respect to going not exactly public but you knew it would be public when you sent the letter to congress about the reopening investigation was just outside the norm and beyond the pale with respect to to what what an enforcement agency should be doing silence being the absolute requirement um in the lead up the immediate lead up to an election what what what's the response to that yeah and so i will dive uh, i try not to get too deep into the details but the details really matter here because first of all you know that at the end of in the end of the investigation so in the first week of july the investigation is completed, and I made a decision to not do the normal thing, which is stand next to the Attorney General and announce it, and offer transparency to the American people, but instead, for reasons we can get into if you're interested, 
but to try and separate myself from a person I liked very much, the Attorney General. But, but because I needed the American people to know this was done in a good way and you can trust us, to step away from the Attorney General and offer the transparency that we offered. And we offered it, and then I got savaged by Republicans, which I expected, that were in the tank, that it was corrupt, and I defended the work all summer, as did the Attorney General. This was done well, this was done independently, go away, this thing's done. Go away, there's no there there. Yes, there was serious facts, there are facts that are deeply concerning, and they're very concerning, but they don't rise to the level of prosecutable conduct. This case is over, America, you can move on with your presidential election. Now, why do I keep emphasizing that? So be me on October 27th. I walk into my conference room smiling like an idiot because I look at the table, and around the table are the dozen people who had helped me make decisions all year in connection with the Clinton investigation. And they're in the same seats that the, it's like your parents at Thanksgiving, I guess, they're in the same seats by habit. And I smile and say, the band is back together, what's up? And then I sit down. And what they tell me is what's up uh, blows me away. They say, sir, this is October 27th, for reasons we can't explain, on the laptop of a guy named Anthony Weiner, and I'm hoping I don't have to explain who Anthony Weiner is, <laughs> but on the laptop of a guy named Anthony Weiner, we can see hundreds of thousands of Hillary Clinton's emails. And the number knocked me back in my chair because we had only ever found thousands of Secretary Clinton's emails. And now you're telling me you found a trove of hundreds of thousands? How is that possible? And then they blew me away even worse. They said, sir, but it's not just that. We can see on the laptop the metadata that tells us there are tens of thousands of her BlackBerry emails. And that meant a lot to me on October 27th, because the problem with a prosecutable case against Secretary Clinton was not that she mishandled classified information. She did, clearly. She talked about top secret stuff on an unclassified system. It didn't matter whether it was her personal system or not. You can't discuss top secret stuff on an unclassified phone or an unclassified room or an unclassified email system. And she had done that. But nobody had ever been prosecuted for 50 years unless there was something else in the case, which was proof that when the person did that, they knew they weren't supposed to be doing that. Proof of, even though the statute didn't call it out, proof of intention. And there was never such proof. And now there, and one of the frustrations the investigators had long had was, we can't find any emails from her first three months as Secretary of State because she was using a BlackBerry then before she migrated to a personal server. So if there was gonna be proof of intention, where would it likely be? At the beginning. And so now they're telling me on October 27th, not only do we see hundreds of thousands of her emails, we see tens of thousands from the BlackBerry era. And then they were explicit. They said, sir, the result of this could change. Holy crap. So what do I do? I just spent the summer telling you all, this is over, it's done, you can rely on us, we're the FBI, we're independent, we're honest. Trust us, go away. Go on with your election. And now I know that what I said under oath over and over again is not true. And not true, not just in some frivolous way, but not true in a way that the result could change. So what do I do? We've long had a norm in the Department of Justice that I still believe passionately in, that if we can avoid it, we take no action in the run-up to an election that could have an impact on the election. If we can avoid it, if you can delay a search warrant without affecting your case, if you can delay an arrest, and the reason is we don't wanna be involved in elections because we don't want the American people to think we're part of the political mess. We have to be a part. So what are my options here? They're both actions in my conception. I could speak and tell Congress that what I told you under oath is no longer true, or I could not speak, which would be an action. Because to not speak, having spoken affirmatively, repeatedly, would be an act of concealment, in my judgment. So what about those two? They both could impact an election. The first one would be awful. Telling Congress we'd reopen an investigation would be awful. What about the second door? Concealing it? In my judgment, again, you can see this differently, but my judgment was it'd be catastrophic to this institution. If the American people ever found out that I knew they were relying upon a false statement by the FBI director, and God forbid the result actually does change, what happens to the institution I lead? 
And so we wrestled with it, a team of 12 of us, including Tricia Anderson. We debated it, and we took a break, and we came back together. And then I said, you know what? Tell the Attorney General's staff that I think I have to inform Congress, because we, we decided between those two options, you got to choose the bad, you can't choose the catastrophic. Tell the Attorney General's Chief of Staff that I think I need to tell Congress, but I would welcome a conversation with the AG. And the answer came back, she thinks it's a bad idea, but she does not wish to speak to him. And so I knew what that meant, that this was going to be for me to take. And in a moment of childishness, I almost said, tell her I've decided not to correct the record, because I knew that that would force her to have to correct the record, because she had testified under oath as well. But I decided that's cowardly. If I believe this is the right thing to do, I should take the consequences. Now, and so we informed Congress. People often say, well, your policy is never to comment on investigations. Yes, in general, there's an exception to that policy, which is when the public interest requires it. Again, I still think, as painful as it is, having announced the investigation, then announced its closing, then defended it, to not inform the public would have been inconsistent with our values. And so I did it. The Attorney General consoled me the next week. She gave me a hug, and I'm not much of a hugger because I'm a giraffe. Um, she gave me a hug and said, I thought you needed a hug. I said, oh, God, did I need a hug? She said, basically, would they feel better if it leaked on November the 4th? Meaning, your decision wasn't all that important because it was going to come out anyway. And in some ways, a leak would be the worst of all worlds because you would have spoken through a leak and concealed from the American people. But that's not why I made the decision. I made the decision because I got to make the decision. And both options suck, and one sucks less. And so that's how we made the decision. I encourage the inspector general to inspect me. Because I believe, as a leader, when you do something that's unusual or different, and Lori, this sure was, you should be transparent and hold yourself out for accountability. And they assembled the facts, then they ripped me. They said, he faced difficult choices, but the choice he made was a profound error in judgment. And I don't know how actually those two things can be true. But I told them to their face, I respect you all, but I disagree. I think if I'd chosen the other door, you'd be writing one that scalds me for destroying this institution in the eyes of the American people. But I don't know. I hope to God nobody ever faces it again. But if they do, they will have your guidance. And so that's how I think about it. And I said to my team that day after we made that decision, no one's ever going to understand this the way we do, because everybody else will be looking back down a path. We will have done this, and something will happen. And everybody will be influenced by that looking back at us. And so in a way, I said to them, you are all totally screwed, because people aren't ever going to fully get this. But that's just the nature of the work. The facts are there if you want them. The analysis is there for reasonable people to disagree about. I wish I hadn't been involved. I'm really actually quite proud of the way that group of people helped me make a decision. So having, having recognized the problems with with second guessing from afar, um, let's second guess from afar and, 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 and turn to your role as not director, but as a potential witness in an obstruction case that um, was investigated by the special counsel's office and ended up in a report of a sort that, that many people here are aware of. Um, what are your thoughts on on that process, on, on how we should think as, as law students about the report and the way it dealt with what you perceive to have been your role in it? I think the Mueller report reflects an extraordinary piece of work by a talented group of people. And failed in the overall mission. And here's what I mean by those two things. The, I thought a special counsel was really important and needed. And shortly before I was fired, Rod Rosenstein had become the deputy attorney general and had promised that when he took office to consider whether to appoint a special prosecutor. And after I got fired and the president started tweeting at me about the prospect of tapes, then I really thought there needed to be a special prosecutor, and took some steps that I thought might hasten that, that involved you, probably ruined your life. Uh, and I'm still grateful for your help, because I do think it was 
powerfully in the public interest to get the story out that there was a reason for a special counsel to pursue tapes at the White House. Bob Mueller came, and the big difference he made that I hope you all get as law students is he assembled an all-star team. The group of agents didn't change much, but he brought in really talented, hardworking prosecutors, mostly from New York, but from other places, and they worked at warp speed. It didn't seem that way to the public, but to put together the cases they put together in under 24 months was extraordinary. And to pursue them aggressively and present them in an excellent way, I think represented the best of us as people who believe in the justice system. So I think that part was great. Where I think it failed in the mission was, I haven't talked to Bob Mueller in three years, so I'm not speaking for him. He didn't even participate in the interview of me because I was a witness. But I think what he was trying to do was something consistent with his character, which was deeply principled and fair. I think he reasoned that because the Department of Justice policy, which binds me, Bob Mueller, because I'm acting in the role of a US attorney here, because policy says I can't indict a sitting president, it would be unfair to accuse a sitting president of a crime because the president would have no ability to vindicate himself through the cauldron of the adversary process or adversarial process. There can't be an indictment in a trial. So to accuse him of a crime would be unfair, so I won't do that. Instead, what I'll try to do is stop short of that and assemble the evidence so that Congress, if it wants to, can make use of it and so a future prosecutor can make use of it. And so I get that in theory, but I think it left him open to accomplishing the harm that he was seeking to avoid, which is smearing the president, which his report kind of does. I mean, lays out in compelling, at least to my mind, compelling language that the president is likely guilty of obstruction of justice crimes. And second, so accomplishes that harm and comes at the cost of confusing the daylights out of the American people. And third, allowing his work to be maligned and distorted by the Attorney General and the President. And so I think all those things happened, that it allowed the American people to be confused, the Attorney General to mislead the American people about what the report said, and so many people just to push the report away. I've read it twice. A whole lot of people have not read it once, even people you would expect to read it. And so I think in the end, he didn't achieve the mission. Now I think part of what you see here is a difference in philosophy between me and someone like Bob Mueller, and I respect his philosophy. Here's mine. As the leader of an institution or a portion of an institution that depends upon the public trust, so if you're the U.S. Attorney in New York or you're the FBI Director or you're the Attorney General, and your institution depends upon public faith and confidence, you must embrace transparency to that public so you can foster their understanding, and ideally, because they have understanding, their confidence. So you have to communicate with them. Bob's view always was, the work should speak for itself. We only speak in indictments, we only speak in the courtroom. And I've long disagreed with that for the reasons that I said. But I'm probably here, and Bob's probably here, and there's a reasonable spectrum in between. But I think in the 400 plus pages, the no short synthesis, no tweetable, sorry, no memes that can be uh, communicated about the report, you see Bob Mueller as he is, a traditionalist. You saw that when he testified. And I think that is not going far enough to foster the need for transparency should, that should be at the core of your mission. So I think great work was done, and the mission was not achieved, probably for other reasons I haven't thought of here, but for those reasons. How should we think about the Bureau's ability to, to withstand the last three years? Um, what concerns do you have or not have with respect to, to the politicization of law enforcement? The FBI and the Department of Justice are gonna be fine in the long run. There isn't a deep state in the United States in the sense that President Trump uses that term, but there's a deep culture and you see it in the Justice Department and its agencies, you see it in the military, you see it in the US intelligence community. Those are parts of the government I know really well. And it goes into bedrock. A commitment to the apolitical exercise of power. A commitment to civilian control, but to the truth. A commitment to the things you would hope they'd be committed to. And the cool thing about culture and the frustrating thing about culture is it's really hard to change. 
I tried to change the FBI's attitude toward diversity, for example. I spent literally every day for four years trying to change how we think about that at the Bureau, and I changed the angle of that battleship. That was depressing for me and hard work. The good news is that culture, that, that ballast, which is unchangeable culture, is going to be fine. No president serves long enough to change those fundamental aspects of institutional culture, so I hope I reassure you with that. The bad part is, in the short run, it affects the institution's ability to be effective. Remember I said public trust is everything? Where the Bureau people are struggling the most is at the margins where the work is done. Because here's a, both an uplifting and a depressing thought. When a president speaks, millions of people Good people believe what the president says. Normally, that's a healthy aspect of our democracy. When the president is a chronic liar, it's not such a great thing. Because when the president says, the FBI is run by dirty cops, or the FBI is corrupt, or it, all of these things, millions of people believe what that person says. And where that has an impact is at the margins, in a jury box. When an agent rises, raises her hand to tell the the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, sits down and says, we found those accounting records in the top left desk drawer of the CFO of this company. And the jurors are sitting there thinking, yeah, I don't know about the FBI. I don't know whether I should believe that because of the corrosive effect of the lies. Or at a doorway, when the bureau agent is making an assurance to someone, if you tell us about this sex trafficker in whose network you have become ensnared. We will remove you, we'll protect you, you can count on us. We will keep you safe. What if that witness, that victim, has a different view of the FBI because of the lies? It affects the work, the ability of the FBI to keep people safe. And so that's what worries them the most and runs down their morale a little bit because they constantly have to ask, answer questions at cookouts or at ball games. Are you a bunch of corrupt cops? In the long run, they'll be fine. In the short run, the constant lying does great damage. So what am I doing in this weird phase of my life? It was never one of my career goals to be a B-list unemployed celebrity. <laughs> but I am, and I have intentionally stayed that way. I have not accepted another job, and here's why. I want to be free to speak for the FBI. The current director has a very difficult job to do. He often can't speak for the men and women of the FBI, so I'm gonna. I have no idea why 1.3 million people follow me on Twitter. It makes no sense at all to me. But I am gonna tweet and defend that institution because I know it well. And I'm also gonna use the time between now and November to try and speak the truth as often as I can, about as much as I can. And then I'll figure out what I wanna be when I grow up. But I need to speak. Everybody who knows enough to speak credibly should be speaking today about these things. Because the FBI is flawed. It's made up of human beings. I used to say every day as director, today, one of the 38,000 employees here is doing something they shouldn't do. I just can't see it. Yes, it's flawed, but it is a fundamentally honest institution made up of fundamentally good people. And it's a crying shame if the American people, because they are told lies, don't realize that and let the lies affect the ability of those people to do good work. As we try to bolster confidence in, in the FBI as an institution. What do we do about the recent Inspector General's report with respect to the FISA process with, um, when it came to the, the Carter Page warrants, which without going into great details, shows a level of uh, miscommunication or, or lack of candor in certain aspects, not speaking of you in, in any particularity, but, but of speaking of, of more than one person in the Bureau, more than that one person you spoke of who, who, who is um, budgeted to do a bad thing a day. Um, what do we do about that? First, read it, celebrate the transparency and the detail, and then look for the learning in the detail. So I see in that report two significant pieces of learning. The top line should be, all the stuff you, America, were told about the FBI, being an anti-Trump cabal, spying on the campaign, engaging in treason, all of these things the FBI was accused of over the last two years, those were lies. Those were lies. So where does the institution go to get its reputation back? I don't know. 
But we have to stare at that truth and talk about it. It's the reason that I asked to go on Fox News and booked myself, my agent did, on Fox and Friends. I want to go on Fox and Friends and sit on that couch and say the things you have told your viewers for the last two years, the things the president has said that you channeled, that was all bogus. Let's pause and think about that. Then once the report came out, they canceled me, wouldn't let me on. But I got on Fox anyway with Chris Wallace and I said to him, I'm gonna talk about the second piece, the, the problems, but don't forget that top line. All that stuff about this institution that we all need, those things were lies. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, yeah, there's all kinds of badness in connection with that particular FISA. And if I were still director, I'd be doing what I assume the director's doing right now, is figuring out, so what happened here? There were 17 serious omissions or mistakes where everybody thought somebody else was checking on something or they decided not to include something in an application to the court because they thought, ah, it's bogus. Of course the subject says that. Strong pause has to be done there. And the question asks, so what's the cause of this? And I don't know the answer. It could be that it's something about the way that case was staffed and deployed. Could be. Or it could be there's something more systemic. It could be something about the non-adversarial nature of FISA proceedings that's maybe let a sloppiness, a laziness creep into the process. I don't know. I said on Fox, and when anybody asked me, I was overconfident in the process because I knew how hard it is, how hard it is to get a FISA. And agents and analysts used to complain constantly. It involves 100 people and all kinds of checklists and boxes and levels of review. And so I thought when a FISA comes to my desk, it's all been checked out. All this work has been done. An interesting question is, is there something about that complexity that contributed to the problem where everybody was able to assume somebody else will catch this down the road? I don't know. But I loved Inspector General's reports for the same reason I hated them. They were, it was always like reading uh, your own reviews and rate my professor, that <laughs> it, it, it causes you pain because they find mistakes. But then you realize that in that pain is ways for me to get better. And so if I were director, I'd be saying, great, this is terrible. Let's find ways that this can improve us. And I don't know yet what the, what the answer is because I don't know what the cause is. Pause. But the problems were in one part of one part of an overwhelmingly complex investigation. That doesn't diminish their importance, but it brings me back to the first point. All that stuff about the FBI, those things were all lies. They just weren't true. One final question before I open it up. Um, certainly in, in my conversations with students around here, and I'm sure with, with yours with other people, the, question regularly comes up, how do I think about government service? I was thinking about doing government service before. I'm really not sure now or worse. I can't imagine doing it. What do you say to those people? Oh, do it. Oh, man, do we need you. Yes. What, what's that? OK, Boomer. OK, Boomer. <laughs> we have totally screwed it up. Totally screwed it up. OK. How great is that, right? Expectations are incredibly low. You can only make us better. Uh, here's one of the reasons I wrote a book. I did not expect to get fired. I was surprised to get fired. I knew by May of 2017 the president didn't like me. And I thought, that's good, because in that frostiness will be distance. He's trying to bring me to his team. I'm not going to be on his team. It's good that he knows that. And I'm running an investigation that touches his campaign. There's no way I get fired. And so I was surprised to be fired, surprised to learn about it on television while I talked to employees in Los Angeles. Scroll it again? Yeah. Okay? Check, check. OK, sorry. That's all the time we have. <laughs> um, I was surprised to get fired, so I was numb for a while and couldn't figure out what I should do. And I decided to write and speak for the reasons I said and for another reason. I was worried that talented young people would find the entire notion of participating in the public life of this country so icky that they would step away. That they would pursue, that you're still gonna pursue work that brings meaning to your lives, but you would try and do it in a nonprofit far away from the public square. And my worry was, then we're, then we're totally screwed. And so I need to try and be part of trying to encourage great young people by showing them what it can be. Right? There's no perfect leaders I've ever met, there's some great leaders 
And it's possible to be an ethical leader, meaning make decisions in the right way, and then maybe I can be part of encouraging and inspiring people. So that's what I've set out to do, teaching over the last couple of years in writing. Here's the good news, I'll jump to the end. The opposite of what I worried about has happened. Young people are stepping forward and saying, I will participate, I will make this better. Please keep doing that. It's the right thing to do for our country. It's the right thing to do for you personally. The danger coming out of an elite law school is that the siren song of success will crowd out everything for you. I think Einstein said to young people, try not to become people of success, try to become people of value. I hope you will taste public service in some way. And I don't mean just in the government, I mean pursuing it as a federal defender, participate in seeking justice in the life of this country. That's the path down which value lies. Not much success there, you'll have trouble paying your credit cards and stuff. But if you get to the end of a life and all you've pursued is success, you're gonna be sorry. With my students, I always ask them, write on a three by five card the following sentence. At the end of your life, who do you want to have been? Write the description. This is who I am. I guarantee none of it's gonna mention the normal markers of success. I hope it'll mention the things that lead to value. Doing work with moral content, where your job is to pursue justice, is deeply, deeply rewarding. You'll never be sorry. In my family now, I got three AUSAs and a police officer. They are people who've decided they want to try and pursue that path of value. I'm deeply proud of them. Tell my son is the only philosophy graduate from an elite liberal arts college to become a police officer. He said, Dad, I'm in good shape and I want to help people. And finds it deeply rewarding. Please do that. You will never be sorry. You probably won't be able to do it for a whole career, but do it at least for some. We need you. Now, if you are asked to take a position, high-level position, say on the staff of the current attorney general, we should talk. <laughs> but if you are asked to become an assistant U.S. attorney, to participate in the general counsel's office of the FBI, to become a federal defender, to go work at a DA's office, to go work in advocating for victims, do it. You will never, ever be sorry. And in fact, it'll be part of that sentence you write on your card, and you'll be glad you did it. Let's open up to some questions. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Could you talk a little bit about going from being a competent attorney to managing attorneys and then eventually managing a whole department, especially when you have new ideas like pursuing crimes because they're crimes rather than just high conviction rates? Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the bit about me being a competent attorney. Um, <laughs> It's a totally different thing to be a leader than a doer. And the problem that institutions make forever is identify the best doers and say you will become the best, we'll have you lead the doers. When you gotta know the game to coach a team, but it's about a whole lot more. It's why I don't imagine Michael Jordan would be a great coach of an individual team, because he has a focus on himself that pushed him to be one of the greatest, or the greatest of all time when to be a good leader, your focus actually has to be outward towards the others. How do I help you all be better as a group? How do I help you develop? It's about you, 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 and not about me. And so the first thing you need to realize in becoming a leader is that shift in attitude. Being a leader is all about other people's problems, and it's a freaking nightmare a lot of days, because you'd rather focus on your own problems. When I became US attorney, Bob Fisk, a legendary U.S. Attorney predecessor of mine gave me great advice. He said, don't try to run the cases. Take care of the people and let them do the cases. If you try to do both, you'll screw them up. And so it was interesting as U.S. Attorney, I was dying to dive into the cases, as FBI Director, dying to dive into the cases, but I had to pull myself back and say, that's actually not your job, man. Your job is to find great people motivate them, knit them together, deploy them, and guide them. Second, the way you guide them matters enormously. Because what a leader has a real opportunity to change is human culture. I talked about how hard it is to change, but you can influence it. And I'll influence it with a story, show you how I tried. When I was U.S. Attorney here in New York and became it, I first, right after 9-11, I discovered something strange. 
When Dan and I were assistants, there was a tradition that after every trial, you went and saw the boss, the US attorney. Now Rudy was typically out uh, campaigning or something when we were there, and so you'd meet with his deputy a lot, but you'd go see the boss. And so when I became US attorney, I thought that'd be exciting. And I discovered that only people who had obtained convictions were coming to see me. And that scared the daylights out of me, and here's why. Oh, I'll tell you what I did. I issued an order, everyone will come see me, no matter what the result, hung jury or acquittal. And then with the hung juries and the acquittals, I would make a big deal of it and not hug them physically, because I told you I'm not a hugger, but I would, I would thank them for their work, thank them for pursuing justice, and really make a show. So what was I doing? One thing that was obvious, and two that they didn't know I was doing to them. The first thing was, I want to send a signal that sometimes when the cause is just, you have to pursue a case where you might not obtain a conviction. Right? If, if, you have, if the case is just and the, and the evidence is there, sometimes it's your job to pursue it. But what I was secretly doing was, I wanted to be in their heads on Saturday afternoon. Because the danger of allowing a culture to become winning is the thing that matters, is that on Saturday afternoons when you're going through your file about to make discovery, and you find a document that may hurt your case, a little voice inside your head will say, losing is bad, losing is bad. And that may influence what you do, which would be a tragedy. So I wanted to be in their head saying, he doesn't really care. He wants justice. He wants justice. So that on that Saturday afternoon, that assistant U.S. attorney would turn that over to defense lawyers, because otherwise the culture is going to go bad in a significant way. And so I tried to embrace as a leader my job of influencing that culture at a values level and trying to do it in ways that made a difference. And I'll say one other thing. I've always believed the Department of Justice should be led by political appointees. I think that that institution should be responsive to the American people through the election of a president who talks about criminal justice. But the difference is a single letter. It is okay for a president to run for office saying we need to do more cases, S, plural, of a certain kind, child support enforcement, environmental, immigration, I don't know, gun. It's never okay for a president or an attorney general to drop the S and say, we need this case, never. Because in the dropping of the S, the divide, which is essential to the Department of Justice between the political and the apolitical, which is the most of the institution, becomes erased, and the institution risks becoming all of it, a political institution that doesn't deserve the confidence of the American people. So what I would preach when I was a senior person in the Department of Justice is never, ever issue an order without the S. Never, because you will compromise the essence of this institution. So I hope that's useful to you. Yes. getting involved with uh, public service, the government and institutions, but as all of these things become incredibly more politicized and polarized in, and in changes being so felt from administration to administration, what would you say is the role of someone who wants to go into that, but who does not stand on the same ideological basis as the current administration, and therefore the same ideological basis that the, the person in question believes in does not, is not represented in whatever branch they want to get involved in? Yeah, that's a great question. Pick the place to work that's most consistent with the apolitical nature of the, of the institution. I'll stay with justice, which I know best. Pick the place to work and at the level that's most consistent with your values. Right? I mean, I said it kind of trying to be funny, but not entirely funny. I, I wouldn't want one of my three AUSA, I have two sons-in-law, one daughter who's an AUSA, I wouldn't want them on Attorney General Barr's staff. They wouldn't, wouldn't want worry. to be there. What do you say? I wouldn't worry. Yeah, there's no worry about that. I wouldn't want them there. Uh, <laughs> but I, there are two flagship U.S. Attorney's offices, and they love the work. They can't feel that in the work. Now, there may be U.S. Attorney's offices where it would be easier to feel, so you just want to avoid those. But take one that I used to lead. The Southern District of New York does not give a rip 
what's going on at a political level in Washington. And the most important thing a U.S. attorney does in the Southern District of New York, which I think Jeff Berman has done well, is to protect that specialness. And I believe that's true in the Eastern District of New York, which I also know pretty darn well. And so those offices, you won't feel it. And I was in AUSA through all kinds of controversy and administrations that changed, and I didn't feel it. Now, as you get higher and higher, it gets more challenging because you move. My homely metaphor is I go to the, like to go to the Outer Banks of North Carolina, and you've got the sound and the ocean. And where the ocean meets the sound is this area of weird turbulence. The sound is the essence of the Department of Justice. The political is where the waves are. The more senior you get, the more you stand in that uncomfortable position. Your footing's a little bit off. But as an assistant U.S. attorney or someone working in the general counsel's office or the FBI or the CIA, you're here. And if you pick your spots right, it's going to be fine. You will not feel this messiness. If you find yourself feeling that messiness, decide for yourself whether you're comfortable being there. But it is what makes, in 1905, Henry Stimson became the U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York and then became the Secretary of War under, under uh, President Roosevelt. And Stimson fired everybody because he thought they were all political hacks. And he began a tradition that exists today. He said, I'm going to hire smart young people. He hired Felix Frankfurter and a bunch of other people. And he said, I want you to stay just a few years, work like maniacs, and then leave. Believe it or not, that's one of the few times I've ever seen culture, the inflection of culture, change dramatically at a moment. That culture still exists in lots of institutions, including the Southern District of New York. Find those and be part of those. Now, you want to be a federal defender? There's a world-class federal defender operation in this city in both districts. You're not going to feel it there at all. In fact, it'll be a ton of fun. <clears throat> but what I mean is try to find work with moral content. Try to find it at a place that you're not near that turbulence, and you will never be sorry. Yeah. Mr. Komi, thank you for your service to your country. Uh, I happen to have purchased and read your book, Higher Loyalty. And I encourage all of us, if you have the time, you can buy, purchase it, and read it. Now, there are several stories that you narrated in the book. One of my takeaways was the ability to sometimes stand true to power, even when it was not comforting. I remember a story where you narrated where a former attorney general asked for a in the hospital. And then, uh, <coughs> then attorney general, uh, Alberto Gonzalez, was there uh, for him to sign the document. And somehow you got to know about it. And before you get to the hospital, you call on Bob Mueller, who was at the time the FBI director. And your purpose was not to allow the agent to let you to, to, to not give you access to uh, uh, General Ashcroft at the time. <coughs> and then you get there, but you were able to stand true to him. There was another, in there was another instance where you narrated in the book, you at the White House, and Could we get to a question, please? Because I think there are other people who yeah. have questions, too. My point is, what is your source of your courage? And how do you encourage young people to stand up even when it's tough at the time? Yeah. I, I'm actually not... I actually don't think of myself as a courageous person. I think of, my, I think of myself as a person who knows he's going to die. And that's kind of a depressing thing to say. but. I've been thinking about the end of my life since I was a senior in high school when a home invader came into my home and nearly killed me. And I really thought I was, I knew I was going to die that night. And it really had an enormous impact on me and in a lot of different ways. But it made me not sweat a lot of the stupid things. And it made me constantly ask myself that question, who do I want to have been? It's almost, my life is almost over. Who do I want to have been? And one of the cool things about law school is you're constantly being drilled to practice that, to float in space and time. When people press you, when professors press you, so what could be said about this if the law evolves in this way? What would be said about this in a different place and time? You're actually practicing what's been so helpful to me, which is to float and look back. And, and in the future, people aren't going to listen to me say, well, I was worried people would be mad at me. And so I made this decision or that decision that, that doesn't seem principled. 
from the future, that's not going to be acceptable. <laughs> the answer is going to have to be, I did the right thing for the following reasons, and I thought about the right things. So knowing that and having that perspective is what helped me. Now, I wasn't, I really I don't think I was a hero in the whole uh, surveillance standoff thing, because great lawyers at the Department of Justice had told me, we can't find a lawful basis for a lot of what's going on in this surveillance program. I'm the acting attorney general, so what am I going to do? Say, well, even though you say there's no lawful basis, Vice President Cheney is really pissed at me, so I'm going to sign off on this. I really, there was no other way to go, because I lead an institution that's committed, I believe, to trying to get to the right answer. But that, that's how. That perspective, floating to the end, looking back and saying, how will I explain this in a quiet room, explain it to my grandchildren, will help you make better decisions. Yeah. Push. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, you spoke a lot about the culture of the institutions like the DOJ and the strength, um, the values that sort of animate these institutions. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, over the last two decades or so, a lot of people have said we've seen an erosion of civil liberties, whether you're talking about enemy combatant status or drone killings or the NSA's domestic surveillance. Um, and I'm wondering whether you see a risk in you know, when people in, in positions like yours are constantly choosing between a bad door and a worse door, um, you know, this, this culture has been kind of put up as a defense for, for some of these, these erosions that say, okay, trust these institutions. And I'm wondering whether over the course of that, you might see that kind of gradually we're steering the battleship in the wrong direction, as you say. Sure, there's always a risk of that. And it's hard to transact on an abstract level, but the antidote to that is transparency. Offer as much of the basis for what you're doing and the, and the gist of what you're doing so people can argue and fight about it. And, and do all of that recognizing one of the great strengths of humanity, which is an ability to convince ourselves that we're righteous. And, and as a leader, always worry about that. Always, always worry. If I can't convince myself I'm awesome, I don't know, I don't know what I can do, it's pretty easy. And so transparency helps you guard against that and surrounding yourself with people who will tell you when you're full of crap. But sure, it's always a danger that we'll drift. And, and I don't have a great answer other than to equip smart people with the details and let people battle it out and hash it out. I think one more. Yeah. Uh, in your book, you uh, push oh. back. Sorry. What? Yeah. So we'll do two. We'll do two we'll more. We'll do two then. more. Sorry. Big finger. You go first. Then who was speaking? Go. I think a guy right there to your right, Dan. Who is speaking? Oh, uh, sorry. Yes. In your book. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, in your book, you push back on the idea of even the term mass incarceration. So I just yeah. I wonder if you could kind of try to talk about where you think the disconnect is between people who look at all the statistics about who gets put in prison and the work that you see individual prosecutors doing. Yeah, I'll see if I can do that briefly. I, I had a really, cool is the wrong word, really interesting conversation with President Obama about this, and I recount part of it in my book, where I told him that what, I, what strikes a dissonant chord in my ears about the term mass incarceration is that it connotes a moral illegitimacy to an effort that at least in large part I believed had important moral content. I spent a lot of time in Richmond, Virginia trying to save lives. Nearly everybody killed in Richmond was African American and the work in my career actually that I'm proudest of was the work to try and reduce that homicide rate in Richmond, Virginia. And to do it required us to participate in tragedy, which was to lock up a lot of young men of color. And so there's no doubt that's a tragedy, but it had a profound impact, at least in my view, in large part, on changing the number of people dying in Richmond, Virginia, which was a problem, by the way, that most white people didn't think about or care about, because it was those people over there. And so what I said to the president is, it's an absolute tragedy, and there are way too many people in jail, but underneath all that is work that is moral in nature and important. And so there are ways to change the criminal justice system to be better, 
But there really are tens of thousands of people every day in this country who are beaten, raped, br bullied, brutalized, and defrauded, and a wildly disproportionate percentage of them are people without privilege, people who are marginalized, people of color. And so, to my mind, to paint the entire system with this term mass incarceration is to connote a Korematsu-type immorality that the, the subject is way too complex for. And so I said to him, I just, I hope, sir, when you talk about it, you'll realize that that complexity is in it. And he had a great response to me, which is, got it, thank you. But he said, you need to realize that the people of my community, he meant the African-American community, see that complexity, and you need to understand why they resent it, why they resent the need for you to be locking up so many men, young men of color, why they resent the need to have you on their block, which is itself extraordinarily complex. And so with the conversation, I hope I was useful to him. He made me smarter in a lot of different ways, but that's how I think about it. And so to my mind, the term is a little bit, uh, lazy is too pejorative of a term, but it, to my mind, it's a misleading term, and I'd like to embrace the tragedy and the complexity uh, more fully than the term allows. Last question. Thanks, Director. Uh, I'm wondering briefly if you have some thoughts about the uh, ongoing impeachment trial going on right now, and assuming that the it's acquittal- It's still on? It's still on. Um, and assuming that the acquittal happens, A, do you have a candidate for 2020? And B, uh, what do you think the case to the election are? <laughs> um, I don't, um, I don't have a view. It seems clear to me it's, it's going to end uh, with an acquittal. I, I thought the House of Representatives had no choice but to impeach the president. I had said publicly in a way that confused people after the Mueller report came out that I, as a private citizen, I kind of hoped that President Trump wouldn't be impeached and removed from office at that time because I thought that would let the American people off the hook. Uh, we need a moment of inflection in this country where we decide who are we and how do we want to be led, and impeachment or removal would short circuit that in a way that would let us off the hook. We need to get off the couch and stand up and say, this is what I believe, this is who we should be. And uh, I don't think they had a choice but to impeach him now. What will happen this fall? I don't know. No one, surely no one cares who I think ought to be the Democratic nominee, but I will offer myself, if I can be useful in any way, and I don't know whether I can, but I'll offer myself to whoever is the nominee because somebody else needs to be president of the United States, and that's a value statement. The president of the United States cannot be a person who is morally unqualified. It cannot be a chronic liar. It cannot be a misogynist. It cannot be someone who sees moral equivalence in Charlottesville. That's not about judges or taxes, whatever other people's passions about. That's about morality. And I used to think that Republicans believe you had to start there, that character was destiny. So somebody else needs to be president of the United States, and any of the candidates that I see is much more qualified on those dimensions than the current occupant. And so, but I very much, so that's first. Second, I hope it's somebody. The cool thing about America and the reason that we're gonna be okay is we're a country with an enormous, normally disengaged and exhausted middle. We're a bell curve. That great lump in the middle is 67% of America. They're exhausted. They need to get off the couch and say what they want this country to be and hope very much that the Democrats choose someone who can motivate them to get off the couch and participate. Because I, I very much, have, I have all kinds of passions about policy. This isn't about that. This is about the character and integrity of the office. It needs to be somebody else. And the best chance of it being somebody else is someone who can appeal to as much of that exhausted middle as possible. That's my view. But um, I, I was optimistic by the engagement in 2018. I remain deeply optimistic about the future of this country. If you graph us, so I'm going to freak you out with math now, right? X-axis, time, Y-axis, progress against our ideals. America has never fulfilled its ideals. We held truth while we held human beings as slaves. So our line is imperfect, but it's always upward sloping because we're always making progress against our ideals. But stare at that line, it's jagged. We make progress, we retreat. We make progress, we retreat. Our progress always exceeds the last retreat. That's why it's upward sloping. We have just experienced a retreat. We will inevitably, if you know American history, experience another upward line move, huge move. 
How fast the line moves up and how big the line move is depends upon you. And everybody else in this country, please move the line and move it quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.